Jingawa. G'day. We're coming to you from Gadigal country. In the local language, we well may say, Ungungama Niab, Tali Nurangum, Pani Jaminka, Tiakala Niab. Let's extend our hand in friendship and walk together as friends. That's right. We're here together to celebrate Reconciliation Week. We have some special stories coming up about two of our favourites, plants and people. Tropical plants and desert plants are not often seen together, but here they're happily growing all in the one place. And that's because this is a garden that mixes the rare, the exotic and the unexpected. And we're going to meet the gardener behind it all. Join me with two incredible women, Aboriginal <laughs> elder Auntie Beryl Von Aplu and well-known chef Kylie Kwong. We talk all things friendship, Cheers. native plants and lemon myrtle butter biscuits. Do you like your compost hot or cold? I'll give you the lowdown on both methods so you can choose which one's right for you. And we meet an archaeologist and researcher working to connect us all more deeply with the places we call home. Take a load off. Clarence, there's nothing I love more than visiting you here at the South Everly Rooftop Farm and on this occasion celebrate Reconciliation Week. Mate, it's great to see you and what a theme this year. Be brave, make change. Who doesn't want to do that? I've been following this project from the outset and I suppose your intent has always been to try and change people's perspectives on native plants and how they connect plants to culture. How, how's it been going? This is a public space, so people can come up and they can enjoy what's here, but they can really get a sense of what some of the species would have been around this area and some of the species that were important to Aboriginal people in New South Wales. And we really want people to understand that connection to country, that connection to culture, and understand that, you know, Aboriginal people have been using these plants for thousands of years. And out of that can come so much collaboration. Yeah, that's true. And look, you know, people connect over plants and over gardens. And what better way to include and involve people from all walks of life? Really, what can't a garden do? Well, not much, but certainly can't pour a glass of water. So <laughs> let's get out of here. <laughs> Definitely. Why are some plants frost tender, like the banana behind me, and others just laugh at it, like the kale here? Well, some plants have evolved in cold climates that get near to or below zero regularly. And they've used a range of strategies for this. Some have thick trunks, so they hold on to good amounts of heat. Others have nice big canopies that stop the frost from settling in the first place. And others have developed cellular mechanisms, a bit like antifreeze, that stop them from freezing in the first place. When you're planting out your veggie garden, give some thought as to the spacing of the individual seedlings. I generally go by about 30 centimetres apart for each individual little one. Lettuces, they'll take up that sort of room. If you crowd things out too much and put them too close together, you're going to end up with lots of pests and diseases. It's better to give them a happy, well-spaced home. Why is it that certain plants have purple undersides to their leaves? It's an interesting question because a wide range of plants have them. Begonias will have purple undersides. This little plant here, Ledvoria, does, and so does this Okinawa spinach. And one of the things that they tend to have in common is that they grow on forest floors. And when you're in an evergreen forest, not much light actually makes it to the floor. And this purple coloration just makes them a little bit more efficient at capturing sunlight that bounces off the forest floor. Sharing knowledge and skills is an important part of reconciliation, but it's also critical for building capacity to care for this beautiful country. And Millie's catching up with a group who are growing their own collaborative environment for learning and nurturing. This is Bunurong country, on the Mornington Peninsula, about an hour south of Melbourne. Like so many regions, over the last 200 years, it has been widely cleared for agriculture and things like vineyards. But this private property has some pretty rare remnant coastal bushland. 
I'm always so excited to spend time in a place like this. I mean, the truth is I could be here all day exploring. But the reason I'm here is to meet up with the crew from the Warren Beak Ranger Program, and I can't wait. I'd like to welcome everyone to this country. I'd like to thank my elders, past and present, and all you lovely people here today. Also, I'd like to acknowledge my ancestors. Um, without them, obviously, I wouldn't be here. Smoking ceremony is very important to Bunurong because when we welcome another tribe onto our country, we smoke them first to cleanse their bad spirits. Other clans will know by the smell of the gum leaves that's been smoked onto them that they've been welcomed onto the country. Warren Beak means saltwater people in the local language. It's a training program for Indigenous rangers developed with the Bunurong and Wurundjeri yeah. Land Councils. In fact, it's a collaboration between lots of different groups, including Homes Glen TAFE and Trust for Nature. So th this site in here hadn't had fire in here for, I'm not sure how long, but I'd be tipping more than 40 years, so a long, long time. Rhys and Ben worked together to get the program off the ground. And it's a nice piece of symmetry that now, three years later, the Rangers are training here at Rhys's place. I have Warramai descendant from New South Wales. And when I moved to Victoria, got a job as a ranger. So that's where it all started for me. And so tell me a little bit about where this course came from. It was partly your doing. I was struggling getting trained people to employ as land management pra practitioners. So there wasn't many Aboriginal people that were trained to work. So I talked with some community members about how we could sort of fix that problem. And we came up with the idea of starting a course. One of the messages coming through from traditional owners is we want to see what it should look like. So they wanted to go to places in good condition. So uh, we teamed up with Trust for Nature who had covenants on land and that helps to protect the environmental values of the place on the property title. Through these covenanted properties, they go to places in the best condition. So they can go and see what their ancestors would have been caring for, and then they can try and transition that back to places that they're trying to work on. So today here at Reese's, we're going to actually be working down in the creek and up, up at the back here. As the course coordinator, Ben ties the work together, connecting the coursework with properties like this one that have a high conservation value. We've picked out a number of special sites where we want to work with this particular course, and this one is an endangered vegetation community, and it's called the Swampy Riparian Woodland. It's quite diverse, actually, in the, in the species that occur here. It starts off with a canopy of Eucalyptus avata, which is the swamp gum. It moves down to a swamp paperbark, the Melaleuca erisifolia, and at the bottom you'll see big tufts of ferns, and the big threat around here is weeds. We get a lot of weeds growing through the middle of the swamp, they can change the way the, the plants filtrate the water and affect the quality of the water that's actually going out into the bay. So we go through, uh, identify the weeds and then try and remove them. So the three things that we're mainly going to come across out here is going to be this caprosma. It's a bit of a small one, but check, check it out. I'll pass it around too. Just have a look at that. It looks a bit out of place in the bush to the other ones. That's the potosporum. Most of those you can pull up by hand, but if you can't, we're just going to cut and paint them. And the third is the bone seed. So the problem with all of them is they're really invasive. They change the soil type below them and they will outcompete the native stuff. So we really want to get them while they're this small before they get too prolific in the area. OK, ready to go. Let's do it. We wanted a model that was less about paper and classrooms and more about being out and doing things. This course basically allows the students to tell the organisers, right, we want this included, we want this included. So at the end of the course, they can go and have all these physical skills in chemicals, chainsaws and all those things, but also have those cultural elements that they can take back to their communities. Mandy's CV is impressive. She's an archaeologist, a specialist in language, a PhD candidate and an artist. And now she's halfway through the ranger traineeship as well. We live in a, a dual world. We have to live in our cultural world and we also have to live in the, the modern world and pay our bills. So there's no better way to be out on country rather than, you know, behind a computer all day. The course provides a culturally safe place for people to learn together. As well as being a trainee ranger, Marissa is a champion boxer and proud Naranjeri woman. It's just really culturally gratifying. I like, I love being with mob. 
We can't really be ourselves, you know, in everyday society. So it's like we're all family. You know, having someone as knowledgeable as Mandy, that empowers me, someone who hasn't had a lot of role models. We want more black women and women in general, um, and they're just doing so much for the community. It's a crew going through the TAFE course that are from all different mobs and we're all coming together and just really enjoying each other's company and, and looking after country together. Trainee Ranger Shane is a Bunurong man and this country is full of the stories of his ancestors. There was this couple who was wrong skinned. They weren't just in the same tribe, but they were in the same clan. So they weren't able to get married or have babies or supposed to be in love. But the guy wanted to go hunt, the girl wanted to go gather. Um, so the elders made a decision to chuck the boy onto the sea and chuck the girl onto the land. Um, to keep them separate? To keep them separate. Um, so the girl turned into the moon tree and the boy turned into the sea. Um, so if you notice, you'll see a moon tree at a beach, it'll reach out to the sea. Um, that's her reaching out to him and they meet at high tide. That's a really beautiful story. Yeah, those, those stories keep me going. Like, um, keep me focused onto, onto this course um, to learn more. Um, I hope to benefit as much as I can out of this course so I can get back to managing land the way it's supposed to be. Kind of feel privileged in a way. Yeah, reconnecting back to my roots way back 60,000 years ago. Graduates of the Wareem Beak Ranger Program will be the next generation of land practitioners and they bring with them much more than just practical skills. Look, academic learning is good on one hand, but it doesn't help you in real life in terms of, you can't learn culture at a university. So being on site, on ground, no academic knowledge can help you look after that country, but your spiritual connection can. We all know Jane has a nose for an interesting gardener. And when she visited the nursery, run by our next guest, she knew she had to follow him home. Cacti and succulents are garden favourites because they feature an astonishingly diverse range of shapes, sizes and colours. Smooth, prickly, furry, cute or imposing. They have it all covered. What's your passion for cacti and succulents? It's the vast array of form and uh, shape that you can get within these plants. In a recent story, I met Dylan Hewlett, the manager and plant buyer of Fitzroy Nursery, where I found out more about how to choose and grow cacti and succulents. This time, I'm lucky enough to be visiting Dylan's own home in the southeastern suburbs of Melbourne, and I'm taking a behind the scenes little peek at his own private collection. Oh, wow, your block is much bigger than I would have thought. Yeah, it's, a, it's over 200 square metres. Well, I've always had an interest in plants, even from a young age, just as I got older and, and actually had the space to let it all run wild. Um, it's just kind of growing from there, so it was never intentional to end up at this point. <laughs> Um, it's just how it evolved. So you didn't start out being a collector, you started out being an ordinary gardener who just collected and collected and collected. That's basically it, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. As I um, was introduced to more specialised plants like cacti and succulents, I went down that rabbit hole. So there are certain plant families that I've followed more than others, but yeah, definitely it's a, an eclectic mix overall. There are hundreds of different plants growing happily side by side in Dylan's garden, but he does have a few hero plants he's particularly proud of. This has just taken on a great spurt, hasn't it? Yeah, so this oh, is Cassonia paniculata, which is um, responding really well to the spring rains we've had this year, and you can see it's put on a bit of a growth spurt. It's that new growth that is so luscious, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and also plants like this, like they get a bit of movement happening into this garden, because. It can be quite static, static yeah. having cacti yeah. and succulents like this. Mind you, the staticness of that golden ball. <laughs> well, that's right. You don't, you don't really need it to do too no, much No, just that, sit there you? and look aggressive. Yeah. <laughs> now, I see two plants that I love. The silk floss tree. That's it, The yeah. two of them. 
Yep, so we've got a couple of uh, Ciba speciosa in here, um, which I actually grew from seed. Now, that one hasn't got any spikes, and this one's well and truly spiky. Yeah, so that was definitely what I was after, um, and this one's decided to be difficult to not grow any spines. I really like that. That's a beautiful form, isn't it? Yeah, so that's, that's agave blue mm. glow, and that's actually become quite readily available over the last few years. It used to be quite a rare specimen, um, but I'd say that you can pick that up from most garden centres now. So it's a really beautiful plant, isn't really it? It's really lovely. Yeah. It's probably one of my favourite uh, agave hybrids. Surrounding Dylan's cacti and succulent collection is something a bit unexpected, an area filled with tropical plants. Now, here's something that you don't see in Melbourne all that often. That's right. So this is a butterfly bush or a Clerodendron ugandensi. Yeah. And it's actually a really hardy plant. Um, it'll take full sun. It'll also grow in a bit of shade. You've got it nicely layered. You know, the fajoa gives protection. That's right. Obviously, when you think of a tropical layout, you've got many different layers and levels to it. So I've cheated a little bit and um, hung all the plants from the trees. Yeah, rather. the hanging baskets. But then look at the collection in here. That's just a massive collection of of different foliages, like the philodendrons. Yeah, so philodendrons are something that you probably wouldn't think of growing in Melbourne immediately. Here we've got Pinatophytum, we've got um, a large leaf Xanadu here, um, we've got the Martianum as well, so we've got quite a good range there of some um, pretty hardy philodendrons. Because normally philodendrons wouldn't take to the Melbourne cold. They wouldn't at all, and I've tried a few, yeah. um, will just melt. Like, they Milk. will just turn black overnight <laughs> oh. and they're done. So. Oh, how sad, yes. Yeah. And then you've got this spectacular, very different-looking Monstera plant. That's right. So that's, Amazing. Uh, that's Monstera Thai Constellation. I like to have a few plants in here with that variegation through the leaf as well, so you can also see um, different plants through here with a bit of different colour going on the leaf, and that just brings a bit of vibrancy to the garden. The outside garden is just the beginning of Dylan's vast collection because there's even more waiting inside two greenhouses. Oh, gee, there's not an inch of room in here. <laughs> this is my collection of more specific cacti and succulents. Why are they in here? They need protection, do they? They need a bit of protection, yeah. mostly from the cold yeah. um, and also from winter rains. Ah, and why the fan? Uh, the fan, you always want to keep air moving in a greenhouse. You never want to have still air, um, but it also helps to keep the humidity down. Because humidity well. would be the killer, wouldn't it? Yeah. We've got a fair range of cordex plants, like the calabanus up there, you can see. Is the, uh, that cordex is the like cordex. a cork sort of exactly. a layer. Wow. Yeah. Do they store water in there? They do, yeah. My so goodness. A lot of people would be familiar with a ponytail palm. Yep. It's kind of its uh, short cousin. And this gold one, that's a beauty. That's spice. a lovely astrophytum, um, and that's probably 50 years old, something like that, mm. I would guess. And then what's the one at the back up there? That's an ant plant, so that's actually a native to North Queensland. It does store some moisture in there, but the main reason for that swollen base is it actually it has a hollow in there, so it actually creates a habitat for ants to live in there. What do they so do? Are they getting something symbiotically? Symbiotic? It's a symbiotic relationship. The ants yeah. will keep the plant free from pests and will also provide food for the plant. That is just an amazing collection. I really am very much looking forward to the next hothouse, though. You've turned me into a convert of these hubworthias, and this is where you keep your collection, isn't it? That's right. How many have you got? There's about 300 in here. They're beautiful, though. Where do they come from, and what's their sort of habitat? Uh, so they're pretty specialised. They're, they're found in southern Africa. Um, their natural habitat would be actually in the shadow of plants. So they, they grow in a very stony oh. soil, but they also they grow in the shade of bushes. There's lots of different kinds of these hubworthias. Mm. But there's, some of them are flat top, some of them are ridged, some of them are, they're extraordinary. Yeah, so they all have different adaptions to do the same job, essentially. Wow. The, the windows will diffuse the light. Yes. Um, but also on some of them, you'll see these raised areas, mm. um, which are called pustules, which also do the same thing. They, they, they don't have a flat leaf surface, so they diffuse the light um, by increasing their leaf surface. I found this one. That is just magnificent. Yeah, that's a lovely. That's a, that's a Cooper eye. 
wow. type. So they've got fantastic windows on them. They're probably one of the best choice of succulents to grow inside mm. Mm. Um, because of their adaption to growing in shadier positions. So a lot of people often think of succulents as being one of the easier plants for inside, mm. but, but the truth is yeah. most of them need a lot more sun than you can give them inside. But so um, these ones don't. the worthies will cope perfectly well with it. This is a bold and diverse garden that showcases Dylan's ever-growing fascination with the incredible world of cacti and succulents. Well, this garden will never be finished because it's got so many moving parts to it, so there's never a final um, stage of this garden. It will always be movable. There will always be change here. And what about new plants? Maybe a new collection, not just cacti and succulents, something else? Don't tempt me. <laughs> the theme of bravery is something that resonates with me. Over the years, we've both met countless individuals who are bravely leading change in their own lives and their communities. Absolutely, mate. And today, I want to share the story of two amazing women who just happen to be friends of mine and are real change makers. Kylie Kwong and Annie Beryl Von Aplu. It's Reconciliation Week. It's an important time for Australia's First Nations people as we acknowledge our culture and our relationship with country, especially when it comes to growing and harvesting our native vegetation. Auntie Beryl Von Aplu and well-known TV chef Kylie Kwong are trailblazers and educators when it comes to using Aussie native ingredients in cooking. Welcome, ladies. Now, we've all been friends for a long time. Yes. This, uh, we bonded over bush foods, and uh, look, here we are, fully native garden. I hope we remain friends for the rest of my life. Forever. <laughs> Forever, indeed. Aunt, you've been in this area for a long time, but you, you grew up out west in the bush. That's right. I come from Walgett, New South Wales. I'm a Gamilaroi lady, and I grew up on the riverbank up there, on the Nemai and Barwon uh, Darling River, and everything was done on the river. So that's how I learned to uh, find the plants with my elders, and, and uh, we just lived so healthy because we caught the fish in the river, we cooked on the river, we did an open fire, an earth oven, they call it this day and age now, and it was just amazing, and I think that's what has kept me healthy. Kylie, there were a lot of chance meetings that brought about your love of bush foods. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, absolutely. When I discovered Australian native produce, it was a major light bulb moment for me. And of course, I wanted to learn from the best teachers, first Australians. And that's how I came across you. We met at Carriageworks right. Farmers yep. Market and I used to buy all of your beautiful produce. Yep. And you have taught me so much, Auntie, about how to prepare and cook native ingredients traditionally. You know, Auntie taught me how she um, used to steam fish, for example, wrapped up in salt bush leaves, or how you not only bake with lemon myrtle, but also use it in seafood and meat cooking. And remember, I always used to come to your store and buy up your stock of those delicious lemon myrtle butter biscuits. That's they right. were so good, and those beautiful jams and sauces you used to make. That's right. That's where it all started. <laughs> That's where it all started. Yes. And then I sought you out. You were working at the Royal Botanical Gardens looking after all of the native plants. And I have to say, the last 10 years since I've met the both of you, my life has become so much richer. I mean, I'm just so blessed. Even though you both come from different cultural backgrounds, there's so many similarities. There is. Well, I mean, we just had this instant connection. That's right. I mean, yeah. we both love food and families. That's right. And now I think that's why we connected in the first place, because of that background. And then we got to talking about food and plants and what we could do. And that's why Kylie went into it, because she knows that in our culture there's sweet and sour, and that's what her culture is as well. So it, it, it worked. Well, that was, a, that was another That's discovery. Right. When I started cooking with or integrating native ingredients into my Cantonese-style cooking, the, there was this natural simpatico. And yes, we love sweet and sour, yeah. like the, the sweetness of the sugar bag honey and m one of my favourite ingredients, the Davidson plum, that sour, mm. acidic flavour. So sweet and sour. Mm. We're here in Reconciliation Week, but what does reconciliation mean to you, Art? Reconciliation means to me where we can... Um, share our culture with uh, other people and um, our 
food mainly because that's what it's all about is um, sharing and caring. For us it's all about relationships, collaboration, community and families but as you and I both know it's always food that brings us all together. That's right everybody has to eat. Everybody <laughs> has to eat. <laughs> I'm going to head back to my restaurant now so I can prepare you a delicious bush tucker feast. We'll be there, won't be, Clarence? Oh, we'll be there, all right. <laughs> See you soon. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, it's such a beautiful day. Should we have a look around the garden at some of the plants? Yes, that's great. Who picked a great day to come up on? Oh, it's a beautiful day. I'm glad I'm up here. So a lot of these species you would have used in your own cooking. Oh, yes, the salt bush. I'll use a lot of that in salads and savoury dishes, or I do chop it up and put it into sausage rolls, or, you know, it's a very versatile uh, plant for me. And a few of the others, like the bush mint and the river mint, you use those? Yes, I use the bush mint because you only have to use a little bit. Yeah, and that's, and that's the thing about a lot of our, our native species. The flavour right. is just so intense. It is. Uh, one of the... Uh, favourites on the roof uh, is the finger lime. We've, we've finally got them to fruit. Oh, that's great because I use a lot of finger limes. I use them in savoury dishes. I use them in sweets. I use them in biscuits. It's also good for medicinal purposes as well. It's, in it's incredible how, uh, you know, something that w we both grew up with and, and just took for granted. People are so interested in that. Oh, yes, they are. And I know a lot of my friends are starting to grow it in their backyards as well. Then there's the, the other end of the spectrum where people like Kylie are using these ingredients. Yeah, we'll go down there. Maybe she's making salt bush dumplings or something. <laughs> Let's go. Native Davidson plum, and this one here is my stir-fried Australian native greens. It's great. It looks so ah. good. They smell so good. This is my favourite dish, and there's about four different species in there: the warrigal oh. greens, the salt bush, uh, the carcala, which is that beautiful succulent on the top, and then there's some sea blight. And I've stir-fried it simply with vegetable oil, ginger, tamari, oh, yes. and sesame oil. So have a try. What That's do you think? Delicious. Delicious? That's beautiful. Phew. Mm, really good. <laughs> and how, how are most of your uh, customers taking to these flavours? The customers love it and they love hearing the story of how it grew, how it was used traditionally, and they love the fact that it was literally grown and harvested 50 metres from the restaurant, thanks to Clarence. That's great. So, uh, you've been using, you know, native plants in your traditional way. What do yep. you think of the way I, I cook with I it? I think it's really great how you've combined it with the ginger to give Excellent. it that little bit of extra flavour because the saltiness is there from the salt bush. Yes. And then with the warrigal greens, that's got a peppery taste. Yes. And that combination is fabulous. And I love the texture. You know, the succulent, is, it's really juicy. And the colours and the flavour of the native ginger. This is an interesting looking drink, Kylie. It's so beautiful. What an aroma. So this is what we call Lucky Kwong Community Soda. Mm, it's made from the salt bush from this site and also the native bush bit, which you grew. And the pink is from the seeds of the Davidson plum. And 100% of the sales go towards Seed Mob, which is Australia's first uh, Indigenous Youth Climate Network. So. It's a drink for good and it's beautiful, what's more, and it's made from these beautiful Australian natives here. That's great. Well, it's all about culture, community, collaboration and celebration of Reconciliation Week. Absolutely. Cheers, ladies. Cheers, ladies. That's good. Still to come on Gardening Australia. Jerry gets his fill in an incredible abundant garden. Oh, well done. Do you want some? Oh, yes, please. Josh explains the hot and cold of composting. 
and we meet an archaeologist and researcher working to connect us all more deeply with the places we call home. Today I'm just north of Brisbane meeting a woman who built an edible garden so comprehensive that it enabled her to avoid food shopping for a whole year. Sonia and her partner Rob decided they wanted to turn their two-acre property into a food garden about 15 years ago and gradually built it bit by bit. We didn't actually do much planning, it just evolved as we went along. We just took notice of where we walked and thought, well, that's where we'll put a path, so we'll put garden beds either side of that. And, you know, just the things that you, you pick often, of course, you're going to plant those closer to the house. You know, you don't want your eggs too far away because you're sending the kids to get the eggs. And as you go along, you just notice things and set things out according to what you notice along the way. In 2019, Sonia set out on a remarkable challenge to eat 100% of her diet from her garden. So tell me about that decision. Well, I just wanted to see if I could do it. So it was just me. I didn't get the kids to do it, but yeah, I, I did the whole year and it was, yeah, it was really good. It was a little bit challenging at times. Like when people were eating bread around me, I would really miss bread. And also a couple of times when I went to bed a little bit hungry because I'd only had like cabbage or tomatoes, that was all that I could get, you know, <laughs> that night for dinner. But other than that, it was really, really amazing. The connection I felt to the garden, it was just really worth doing and I'd love to do it again someday, especially now that I've got honey. So I'd try, we'll try it again one day. Growing enough produce to live off for a year is a huge achievement, and the fruit trees here on the property would have helped immensely. This truly is a forest of food with a staggering number of temperate, subtropical and tropical fruit trees. There are far too many to name, but for just a taste, there's wampy, lemonade, banana, citrus, peaches, jaboticaba and tamarillo. The forest's understory is edible too, with smaller cover-forming crops like pepino and nasturtium. The food forest is complete with vines laden with fruit. That's unusual. Is it a passion fruit? Yes, it is a passion fruit. It's a rarer type of passion fruit. It's called the Japanese hard shell. So they're called hard shell passion fruits for a reason. And that's why you need a hammer to crack them open. So. We'll give it a go. Oh! Oh, well done. <laughs> Do you want some? Oh, yes, please. Thank you. So it's a little bit creamier than your average passion fruit. And it is sweet and very creamy. It's lovely. Yeah, they're really yum. grow a large number of native plants in your garden. Why is it? What is it about them that you like? Well, we like to grow them because they're adapted to the local conditions and soils, of course. But also, there's so many different medicinal uses with all these native plants that Indigenous people have been using for tens of thousands of years. And um, I just find that really fascinating, you know, sort of uncovering that again and finding out what all, all the uses are. A lot of them are quite tasty, like this one here. It's a native mulberry. It'll have fruit in a few more weeks. So it tastes fairly similar to the exotic mulberry, but you need to get a whole handful of them to get the taste. Sonia is growing so much produce in her garden that she's able to provide for her community as well. Yeah, we have a garden gate store where we sell excess passion fruit, excess pumpkin, some plants at times, and we've got a bit of a following in the neighbourhood. They really enjoy stopping by when they're going on their walks and buying something. You operate an honesty system with your farm gate. Yes. How does that work? Is it successful? Well, yes, it is actually. We were very surprised how successful the honesty system has been. In fact, sometimes we feel like people have put in extra money because they must be just so appreciative, 
So that's our holiday money, actually. Yeah, that money all goes into our holiday fund. And then we go on holidays and we're carrying around all these coins. So it's... <laughs> Well, to get such prolific growth in your garden, you've either struck lucky with brilliant soil or you've done some hard work. Well, actually, this is hard clay soil here. So it was actually terrible like, 10, 15 years ago. But in that time, we've brought in about 150 trailer loads of pre-mulch from the dump. So that's really helped improve the soil. And of course, we compost. Come on. Well, I've never seen a compost bin with so much character. Yeah, I know, she's great, isn't she? My husband made me this for my birthday a couple of years ago, and we call her Gloria, the compost pig. And she's a compost tumbler. When, the, um, when she's full, she spills her guts, and there's the beautiful compost. Good on you. Growing and gardening on this scale takes a huge amount of time and commitment. It's surely a labour of love. At first, we just loved the idea of growing as many fruit trees as possible and eating our own food, but then as we went along, we realised what great benefit it is doing that for the environment. Less plastic waste, less travel miles for your food, less pesticides used, less carbon emissions, all those sort of things. When you grow your own food, you're really helping the planet. So that's why we've continued. Sonia's approach follows an old adage which is often applied to gardening. Start with what you've got and improve it step by step. And the results are truly encouraging. These are probably the hardest workers here at the uh, South Everly Native Rooftop Farm, one of our worm farms, and it's pretty chock solid at the moment. There are thousands of these little oh. guys working away in there. You can yeah, see look them. at them. Yeah, but I mean, this is a really important part of the process to maintaining this rooftop garden because you're dealing with a, a shallow soil profile, so you've got to constantly replenish and refeed it. Yeah, and look, it's a, a, a really great process. All of these natives really like that. It really helps with the nitrogen, um, and it's a really good organic fertiliser. We don't use any chemicals up here, so, you know, what we do add is very helpful. We are fairly lucky here. The, the local cafes and restaurants supply us with food organics, and in they go to the worm farm. The worms do all the work. We literally just keep feeding them, and they just keep eating and breaking it down. We have those beautiful worm castings the lovely organic liquid fertiliser. Whatever we can't use around the precinct, we give away to locals who want it for their gardens, and everyone wins. And look, it doesn't really matter whether you're gardening on a rooftop like Clarence here, or it could be a balcony, or it's in a garden. Either way, you're gonna need compost, and Josh loves making it. The seasonal cycle of any garden will involve pruning, and the removal of plants that are ready for renewal. And they're way too valuable a resource to just throw away. The decomposition of prunings and spent plant material are a source of carbon and nutrients to benefit your garden by reintroducing them to the soil as compost. Composting's part of my life routine, and I've got a couple of methods on the go to make the most of any organic matter that comes from either the garden or the kitchen. Now, kitchen scraps are the most regular type of organic matter that we generate in our household. So, all of this goes into the cold compost. Kitchen scraps are usually full of moisture and rich in nitrogen. So it's a good idea to balance that with a layer of fine, dry brown organic material that is high in carbon like these wood shavings, or dry leaves, or even old toilet rolls, or paper, which I use to line my scraps bucket. Microbes will break down the dry material as part of the decomposition process, but it also provides structure to the pile, which is important for aeration. Now, air's important so it doesn't become anaerobic or sour, because when it does, it produces stinky gases like methane and hydrogen sulphide, 
what you want to do is keep the pile nice and sweet. So if it becomes a bit sour and smelly, start by giving a light sprinkle of ordinary garden lime and then give the pile a bit of a forking to open it up to get the air in so it remains aerobic. I like to do this every few weeks to keep the pile healthy and it really helps to break things down. Having two compost bins on the go works well for our household. As one gets filled up, the compost from the second is ready to go and can be emptied. I find these large open bottom compost bins work well because when they're partially buried by about 100 millimetres and when the lid's on, it keeps out rodents and other pests that might otherwise go for the kitchen scraps. Now, when it comes to position, underneath a deciduous tree like this Nashi pear is perfect because in summer, when there's leaves, it keeps them nice and cool. And in winter, when the leaves drop, the sun comes in, warms up the bins and keeps the microbes working. Cold compost is relatively low maintenance and easy to manage. But you'll need to be patient as it may take up to six months before it's ready to use. Something that cold compost won't do is kill off weed seeds and plant diseases like powdery mildew. To do that, you need to make hot compost. Now, this is a totally different method in that you need to get all of your materials that you want to compost together and put it on as a single batch. And also get that pile big enough, at least a cubic metre, so that it gets nice and hot, retains its heat, and gives things a good cooking. I like to make my hot compost in bays like this, which is made from a frame of salvaged steel, some steel sheeting, and then timber, including timber panels at the front, which keeps things nice and contained and tidy. Then it's just a matter of putting the right ingredients together. I've already made a good start building this pile with layers of chopped up, fresh leafy garden material which is high in nitrogen, as well as dry prunings, which are high in carbon. I'm going to continue building it up in layers roughly 50 to 100 millimetres thick. This is a layer of chopped up dry broad bean stems, then a sprinkle of pelletised poultry manure and some water. Then some more green leafy prunings, then some soiled straw from the rabbit hutch, then more pelletised manure, and more water, and on it goes. The main thing to remember is to use roughly two-thirds fresh green material to one-third dry material, and add manure for extra nitrogen and water to kick things off. I find two bays works well for making hot compost. The first bay, that's filled with a batch that's cooking away, like I've just shown you here. And the second bay can be used to store mature compost. Now, this is ready to go out onto the garden. Look how beautiful it is. And once that's empty, I'll be able to turn this pile, which would have heated and cooled, over into the empty bay. And in doing that, give it a second cooking. And I'll add some extra moisture and manure and chop fine greens as it's needed to get that mix just right and that'll get it hot again and give it a second chance at making sure we've killed off all the weed seeds and plant pathogens. It's as easy as that. So there's the lowdown on hot versus cold compost. Choose one which is right for you and your garden. Or like me, do both. Composting is a way of harnessing the circle of life, really, because even when plants are dead, they can still contribute to new life and the vitality of soil. There's so many ways people view the landscape around them. Our next story follows the path of someone who wants us all to look a little deeper.
I'm so privileged that I got to grow up here in beautiful King Lake West, Wurundjeri Woiwurrung country, surrounded by these beautiful bushlands. The ability to, you know, spend time in nature, on country, uh, listening to the birds around me, uh, really has shaped many things in my life. My name's Maddie Miller. I'm a Darug woman, an archaeologist, an artist and researcher at the University of Melbourne. I'm working with ecologists and scientists to answer questions around how do we care for country, how do we come together with Indigenous knowledge that spans tens of thousands of years and modern science to care for and look after this place. In 2009, the Black Saturday bushfires happened and all of this place, uh, this place that's so green and beautiful today, was burnt, it was all gone. There wasn't a green piece of grass or a leaf left. And for me, that was the first time that I'd really seen what happens when country is unwell. To see that sort of devastation in a place that had been so safe for me, I think really woke me up to the realities of country, of what it needs, of what we're not doing. These big changes like climate change, like mismanagement of country, are fueling these devastating catastrophic wildfires. And so for me, it's something that I've lived and it's something that certainly drives uh, me to make sure that, you know, we're all coming together to think about country as this place that has been looked after for tens of thousands of years, the place that needs us. And how do we all come together to care for country, I think is, you know, one of the more crucial questions of our time. When we talk about country, people might picture a place like where I am today, of this beautiful lushness. But for me, as a Darug person whose country is, you know, large parts of my uh, traditional homelands have been urbanised, and now living in Melbourne, uh, still on Wurundjeri Woiwurrung country, but in a really different setting, it's been really important for me to understand that country flows right across this land, that it's not disturbed by the urban sprawl, that that is still country. And as an archaeologist, I had the privilege of working on many sites in the CBD of Melbourne. And as I excavated those sites, you know, we went through the layers of, of country and we could peel back those layers. So, you know, from the, the modern shop that was tore down through to, you know, an 1870s house and an 1840s house. And then below that, far below that, we get these beautiful layers of Wurundjeri occupancy of this legacy that Wurundjeri people have left over tens of thousands of years. And we'd find stone tools and old waterways and all of these wonderful parts that show us that country is everywhere and this beating heart of Wurundjeri country in particular still exists even in the concreted urban jungle that is Melbourne. We don't stop caring for country where the concrete starts and in our own backyards, in our own gardens, that's still country and we all have a responsibility to care for it. Field recording is a really important part of my artistic practice. It gives me an opportunity to sit and listen to what country's saying. Um, and you never really know what you're going to hear, uh, which I think is, is part of the excitement. So a mob of cockatoos flying overhead or the wind as it rustles through the leaves. It's not silence because it's full of noise, but for me, it's, it's, it's a really mindful exercise. Bringing both of my artistic and my academic backgrounds together, I think they both enrich each other and that gives me a cultural grounding in the work that I do. 
So I'm one of 30 artists involved in the Emu Sky exhibition on campus. And this exhibition looks at Indigenous knowledges from all different science uh, backgrounds, including astronomy and earth science and food science. And it brings together all of these different ways of knowing country in this really beautiful artistic expression. So a central theme of this show and something that the show really celebrates is Indigenous knowledge and all of the different ways in which Indigenous peoples view the world around them and that knowledge that is deeply imbued in our culture and our law. And it also asks the question around why doesn't Western knowledge celebrate this? Why is not Indigenous knowledge included seriously in our more modern understandings of the world. And it really pushes those boundaries around science and whose knowledge is worthy. So I have a piece in the show called Yilabara Nyara, and that asks you to listen in the present moment. I interviewed four incredible Indigenous knowledge holders and we had these wonderful yarns about country. I felt like there was a hook in my gut and the rope attached to that hook was on my country and that they were reeling me to them and I couldn't get there fast enough. My piece really asks the visitor to sit down and listen to these stories and to really, you know, take these concepts of deep listening and internalise what they hear. It also then asks you to collaborate and to look after country as well. And part of that is that while you're listening, you're surrounded by baby river red gums and those river red gums will be planted on country. And after you've listened, we ask you to write a message to contribute to country. And then we'll take those messages and burn them and bury that ash with those baby river red gums so that they may thrive for the next several hundred years. The exhibition is so rich with story and with meaning and every time I come I take something new away but I hope people that visit my piece and, and visit the show also really take away that sense of, of hope, of action for the future, of this idea of coming together in, in respect and working together to help heal country for the generations to come. Grab your tools. And grab a friend. We've got a list of jobs for the weekend. This weekend is Botanic Gardens Day, so why not pack a picnic, grab your family and friends, and spend some time exploring your local botanic garden. If your camellias are all bud and no bloom, they may feel the need for a feed. A splash of liquid potash or a generous dusting of fireplace ash will see them put on a show in no time. Winter grass is starting to take over turf, so it's time to act. As soon as you see the bright green leaves, dig the clumps out and feed to the chooks, or make it into a weed tea for the garden. In warm temperate areas, winter rains are on the way, so get into your gutters and give them a good clean out. Keep the leaf litter for your compost or stockpile it for lovely leaf mould. Now that dahlia foliage is failing, it's time to cut any remaining leaves off at ground level. If your soil's well drained, leave tubers in the ground, otherwise lift and store in sawdust. Take your patch from drab to fab and plant out some purple veggies. Purple broccoli and cauliflower, red Russian kale, purple carrots and peas and coloured cabbages are good to grow now. Subtropical gardeners spice up your garden this weekend and plant out some garlic. Day-length neutral varieties are best in this climate and should be harvested before the December rains. If your foliage is looking funky, fuzzy and seriously splotchy, you've likely got powdery mildew. A mix of one part milk to ten parts water sprayed on the foliage weekly will fix this fungi. Add some ghoulish goodness to your garden and some intrigue to your indoors with a bat plant. A shade lover, this tropical has lush foliage and bizarre bat-like flowers. In the tropics, it's time to put in a dragon fruit. These spectacular night flowering cacti are climbers and they grow best on tall, strong supports. Plus, of course, the fruit is refreshing and delicious. 
The silk floss tree, Ceba speciosa, is a large, fast-growing shade tree worth considering. Related to the boab, the spiny trunk and flamingo pink flowers make this one a showstopper. This is the start of Dini Jungama, season of heavy dew for the Gulumorigen people of the Darwin region, when sugar bag honey, Dadbingwa, is collected from tree hollows. In arid gardens, pumpkins are ready to harvest as their vines begin to die back and the stalks dry. To store, leave about 10 centimetres of stalk attached and store in a cool, dark, dry place. If you're heading bush, remember that plant materials, including seeds, cannot be removed from bushland areas without a permit. It deprives wildlife of food and can damage biodiversity. Textural, trendy, tough and terrific winter flowers, get to know the aloe. Perfect for arid gardens, there's hundreds of these stunning succulent cultivars, perfect for pots and plots. Have a great weekend, gardeners. And if you want more info about Botanic Gardens Day, head to the Gardening Australia website. Well, my local Botanic Gardens this weekend is going to be Cairns, and I can't wait to look around. Mate, what a beautiful spot. And gardens are the perfect place for people to come together. So no matter what you're doing this Reconciliation Week, how about extending it right through the year? And it's all about getting stuck in, just like this garden bed. So be brave, make a change. See ya. See ya. Sophie gives us a cool season tour of her custom-made poly house and shows us how it improves her winter production. It's not often you hear good news about an environmental pest like the camphor laurel, but in this case it's true, because I'm finding out about an innovative technique that converts a weed into a wonderful wildlife habitat. And I'm in Sydney, Sutherlandshire, to meet a gardener who's created a beautiful, low-maintenance space packed with colour. 